Hi, everyone on the YouTube live stream. Can I just check for those folks who are on the chat? If you are hearing my voice, could you just say that you do have your sound working? Hi, everyone on the YouTube. Hello, I'm Lindsay. Um, just to clarify, I'm seeing some messages on the YouTube live stream that says that you had sound, but not anymore. Um, how are That's things like looking no now? No one was speaking. Okay. Hello, I'm Lindsay. Um, <clears throat> okay. I'm going to hope that this is working. Um, I see another message that says no sound yet. Is that still the case? Okay, great. Um, thanks everyone for your responses. Um, hi, and welcome to this launch event for the Marxist Institute for Research. Um, it's a project which uh, Joshua will, will elaborate on in a few moments. Um, we at IMWG, the Interdisciplinary Marxist um, Working Group at UC Berkeley, um, that's me and Alex Walton, um, <clears throat> are really happy to be hosting this event um, as one of various Marx reading groups in the UC system that MIR collaborates with. Um, while brainstorming ideas for this launch event with MIR, we quickly came to the decision that we wanted to discuss third world Marxisms and university struggles 
Topics that the members of our reading group, as well as members of other UC Marx reading groups have found pressing. And um, briefly, so as to leave time for our speakers, given the imminent UAW strike across the UCs, it's not hard to see why. Um, to that end, we're eager to engage um, with both of our speakers' research and really glad to have them in conversation here. Um, as both speakers develop in their work, histories of ideological struggle and institutional formation um, from the 60s to the present, deriving from, in Eddie's case, um, the ideologies and activism of communists of color from the 1960s to now, and in Nick's case, genealogies of critique and its place in the university um, as a vehicle by which the university organizes its institutional reproduction. Their presentations of their book projects, as well as the conversation between the two of them, um, will be the heart of this event, which, um, as I'm sure you know, is titled From Third World Strike to Abolition University, 1969 to Now. In the spirit of celebrating the launch of MIR, what we're hoping for tonight is a conversation which is meant to be um, audience interactive uh, rather than a talk or a panel. So for a brief run of show, um, Joshua Clover, um, Professor at UC Davis, will deliver some further information on MIR. Um, he will uh, also introduce Kit Myers, who will deliver a tribute to our comrade Romina uh, Rivalcaba. Alex will then introduce our speakers who will present on their book projects for about 10 minutes each uh, before being joined in conversation by Colleen Lai. Then we'll have about 45 to 50 minutes for an open Q&A, which Alex and I will, will moderate. And um, finally, if anyone is in the Bay Area or can get there, we'll have an in-person reception starting at 7.30 p.m. at Beta Lounge in Berkeley. We really encourage you to come um, and it'll be lovely to see you there. And again, we're very happy to welcome you all to this launch for MIR, um, a project we're so excited about. Um, we think and hope that this conversation will be a really excellent way to begin. So um, now for some remarks on MIR from Joshua Clover. Thanks, Lindsay. And I want to welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I, I, this is, a, among other things, a launch for the Marxist Institute for Research, which is a new initiative connecting faculty and students across the UC system in historical materials related research and pedagogy. We can't promise that we'll offer you a diversion from national elections every time, but we do promise to keep alive alternative propositions about the path to liberation. I wanna thank the Interdisciplinary Marxist Working Group for co-hosting. They are one of the reasons this network exists and part of its deep history. And because this is our launch, I wanted to offer a brief sort of how it started, how it's going. Uh, we're gonna drop our Twitter and email in the chat right now. And also again, in a few minutes, if you wanna be in contact, more on that shortly. We'll also put all that information on the Twitter itself, which is at Marx Network, at our Twitter handle. We started as a simple project to make sure that scholars doing Marxist shit, I'm quoting somebody's email, I won't say who, or doing materialist inquiry, had access to resources spread across the various UC campuses, faculty, courses, reading groups, pedagogy, members for exam and dissertation committees, syllabi, and sometimes hard to find research materials. Many of us who've done related work over the years have made use of these ad hoc networks and we decided to provide an additional degree of consistency and durability in the hopes it would be helpful to younger scholars and organizers in and around the university. I wanna make special thanks to Annie McClanahan, Charmaine Shaw, Chris Chen, Kathy Wallerstein and Colleen Lai comrades with whom over the course of many years, I've shared ideas and reading groups and other things uh, for taking on the work of making in the first place. We decided to call it the Marxist Institute for Research because it's simple and sort of official sounding. And also it gives us the acronym MIR. Michael Hart immediately wrote to ask if this is for Chile's Movimiento de Izquierda Revolucionaria. It's not. <laughs> Um, as many of you will know, Marx's late writings on the Russian mirror extend his thought more fully beyond the particulars of Western industrial capital while rearticulating his sense of commune and community, moving away from the developmentalist frameworks which informed his earlier thinking on the subject. We find the need to transform our own thinking on these matters no less urgent today. We were fortunate, if you can call global catastrophe good fortune, that the annual theme at the UC Humanities Research Institute was living through upheaval. 
Historical materialism, we suggested, provides uniquely useful tools for grasping the profound interrelation of various aspects of planetary crisis, and in so doing, necessarily displays and demands the interrelation of various modes of inquiry. We felt we had a legit claim both on the topic and on transdisciplinary pursuit. The UCHRI agreed and gave us a startup grant under the subheading Marxism in Transition, committed to, quote, addressing the present desperate volatility as object of study and context for rising global interest in adequate approaches to capitalism and its crisis character, while registering the scholarly and pedagogical need for Marxist thought to engage anti-colonial thought, black studies, gender studies, and other vital currents of contemporary theory. In putting this together, we started to develop our network across the system. First, by inviting faculty participants from each campus to form our so-called hub. Here, I need to pause over a serious and somber moment. One of our earliest and most enthusiastic hub faculty members, Romina Ruvalcaba, passed away this past summer. To mark this irreplaceable loss and celebrate her presence, we have invited her colleague from UC Merced, Kit Myers, to offer a few words of remembrance. Kit, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, thank you, Josh, and and thanks to uh, Charmaine for reaching out uh, to hold space for Romina Ruvalcaba and um, uh, you know our wonderful colleague and friend. Um, uh, I knew uh, even before I told Romina about the Marxist Research Institute that she would definitely be interested in it because um, she's the type of person who, during any occasion, can bring up Marx at least once. Um, we uh, lost Romina in August, uh, just before the semester, and um, her her loss <coughs> uh, devastated us in large part because uh, many of us did not know the extent of her battle with cancer. Um, I, I became of uh, aware of her health in March um, after she had requested that I hold on to her Cops Off Campus shirt that she had ordered um, because she had planned to come back to Merced from Southern California. Um, to, to get it, even, even as she texted me that she was going through um, rounds of chemo. Um, a month later, I witnessed her um, participate in a qualifying exam for one of our grad students. And um, throughout the summer, she intermittently chimed into our department threads uh, with hearts and texts of support. Um, so, so it did catch us all by surprise, and and um, but but she was an incredible scholar, uh, teacher, and mentor. Uh, she was in a, or I was in a writing group with her and some other colleagues in my department, and she uh, was absolutely brilliant in her own work writing about uh, ranchos and Mexican land reform and state violence. Um, she was also extremely generous in her feedback to us, often one of the smartest people in the room, but never making anyone else uh, feel small or, um, or less smart. Um, she was an amazing teacher, a mentor. Uh, she honed her teaching craft at CSU LA and Long Beach before, she, before we were lucky um, to, to welcome her to UC Merced. And here she taught uh, courses on the history of Mexico, Latin American revolutions, Chicano history and culture, and a grad seminar on theory and method. Um, her teaching evaluations uh, are filled with praise for her enthusiasm, her ability to motivate, and her power to transform the way that students <clears throat> approach learning. And she demonstrated her dedication to UCM students by continuing to teach throughout her long and courageous fight against cancer, again, working into the summer months. Uh, Romina was a loving mother uh, to her son, Augie, a beloved daughter 
and an inspiring sibling, and, and we will miss her dearly. Thanks. Thanks again, Kit. Um, and in the most basic sense, um, I think we all hope that the work uh, we'll do as part of this initiative will honor both Umini's memory and her own work. And we hope you might join us in that shared project. I, I should stress that you do not need to be a professional Marxist or an amateur Marxist or, or even have the all important skill of, of working Marx at least once into every conversation. You do not need to be a practicing historic materialist to get involved with the Institute. You really just need to be interested and not a troll. Uh, and you can affiliate or just sign up for the mailing list by dropping us a note. Emily Rich, who was part of the initial core of graduate students who also helped shape this initiative, as were Lindsay and Alex, uh, two of our hosts tonight. Emily has been dropping links in the chat and is about to share again our Twitter, ha Twitter handle and email address and our website, which is hosted by the Davis Humanities Institute, which is also providing the Zoom platform and is our institutional home, so to speak. I apologize that we are not able to make closed captioning available this evening, but we'll do our best to transcribe this conversation and post it after. Speaking of grad student workers, I wanted on behalf of the entire Institute to read a brief statement of solidarity and support for UC academic student employees. In a move of historically unprecedented scope, 48,000 academic student employees represented by three unions have authorized a strike action with a vote of more than 97.5% in support. Extended negotiations with the UC administration have resulted in almost 30 unfair labor practice charges against the university. Basic demands remain unmet. These include wages that reflect the high cost of living in California, support for working parents, disability justice, and stronger protections against bullying and harassment. Scheduled to begin next Monday, this strike would be one of the largest higher education labor actions in history, sending a powerful message across and beyond the UC system to all precarious and rent burdened graduate, adjunct, and service workers in higher education. Uh, more information can be found at uh, www.fairucnow.org. That link is in the chat as well. The MIR stands in solidarity with UAW 2865, which is Union of Academic Student Employees at UC. UAW 5810, postdocs and academic researchers, and SRU UAW, student researchers, as they strike for a better contract and safer lives. The underpaid precarious labor of student workers, particularly teaching and research assistants, makes the core educational and research mission of the UC system possible. Their working conditions are everyone's learning conditions. We hope you will all be able to stand in solidarity with them as well. I wanna conclude and get us to the main event by mentioning just a few things that Mir has upcoming. Now that we, with the assistance of Nick, Eddie, IMWG, and y'all have launched. This is the first of what we plan to be quarterly events co-hosted by Mir and, and by campus specific graduate groups. The winter event details to be announced will be co-hosted by people at UC Davis. Our spring event will feature Jairus Banerjee. For the remainder of this year, these events will remain virtual on Zoom and live stream. We'll also be hosting an event in Los Angeles in April, featuring organizers from Sex Workers Outreach Pro Project Los Angeles, Los Angeles Tenant Union, and we hope K-Town for All. Follow Twitter or check the website for details as they develop. And I wanted to mention finally, an event uh, which has become our central initiative, the Mir Summer Seminar. Each year, 20 to 25 UC graduate students will participate in a fully funded five-day summer school held at a UC natural reserve venue. Oriented each year by a pressing theme, the school will combine faculty-led seminars on Marxist pedagogy and selected research topics, workshops of student research and writing, and guests drawn from within and without the Mir's advisory board comprising internationally admired scholars from Ruth Wilson Gilmore to Michael Hart, Nancy Fraser to Robin Kelly. The summer seminar is supported by the UCHRI and by campus specific members of the Humanities Consortium, including UCR, Irvine, Berkeley, Santa Cruz, and again, special shout out to Davis Humanities Institute. Our first summer seminar will be August 11th to 15th next summer, 2023, 
at the Sage Hen Creek Field Station near Truckee with focuses on pedagogical challenges, challenges in teaching capital and economics for Marxists. Our first annual Mike Davis lecture on the closing night will be given by Glenn Sean Coulthard, Yelena Ivdene scholar. Applications for this will open later in November when our website is active and close on January 15th. We could not be more excited about that. But we are especially excited about tonight's event. I thank you for listening to this extended backstory, but it's time to move on to the front story, so to speak. Let me pass things back to Alex and to our guests for this evening. Thank you again for being with us. Thanks, Joshua, for these opening comments and words about the strike, too. Um, and thank you to Kit for your remembrance of Romina. Um, I'd also like to make a few other thank yous. First to, to Colleen, Joshua, Charmaine, and other Hub members of MIR for making this happen at basically every level from the conceptual to the granular. Um, also to the Davis Humanities Institute for their support in figuring out how to host this event on Zoom and for setting up the concurrent YouTube stream um, at very much at the last minute. So thanks for that. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our guests tonight, Eddie Bonilla and Nick Mitchell. Eddie Bonilla is Assistant Professor of History at Boston College, though if I'm not mistaken, I think he may be joining us tonight from a stint doing research in New York. Uh, his ongoing work on the ideologies and activism of communists of color from the 1960s to the present, we will get to hear a little bit more about in a moment. One central object of that work is to trace the formation of a group known as the League of Revolutionary Struggle out of the unification of Latina, Latino, Asian American, and African American Marxist groups active from 1978 until 1990. While we are eagerly awaiting the full book elucidation of this history, tentatively titled Homegrown Communists in the Age of Reagan, Multiracial Politics and Socialist Revolution, one piece of that project has recently appeared in the spring 2022 Southern California Quarterly called Latino, Latina Latino Communist Activism and the FBI during the Chicana Chicano and New Communist Movements. This history of the August 29th movement, told there in part through FBI surveillance records, kind of remarkably of these groups, offers one of the, one version of the development of what Eddie calls homegrown communists, moving from positions of cultural nationalism rooted in their communities to a Marxist internationalism of the League, and does really incredible archival work to bring out the foregrounding of race and grassroots activism in the new communist movement. Um, so we're very, very excited to hear more about that tonight. And joining us from, I believe, a little closer to home is Nick Mitchell. Uh, Nick is at UC Santa Cruz Associate Professor of Feminist Studies and Critical Race and Ethnic Studies, and the author and co-author of a remarkable body of work exploring the ways that knowledge and its institutional practices arrange social worlds. This includes an invitation to abolitionist university studies, co-written with Abigail Boggs, Eli Meyerhoff, and Zach Schwartz Weinstein, as well as two recent pieces, a review of Frank Wilderson's Afro-Pessimism for Spectre and Summertime Selves on Professionalization and the New Inquiry, which I hope you read if you haven't already had a chance. Though this work is wide ranging, one of its central imperatives salient to our topic this evening is to reflect the less acknowledged political trajectories that make possible the work that we do as Nick puts it in the great essay, Critical Ethnic Studies Intellectual. If the demand for theory in Black studies or ethnic studies is also a vehicle by which the university organizes its institutional reproduction or a way of managing crises, then to narrate the origin of these fields in left activism alone is, Nick writes, to risk confusing family romance for history. Um, so a little bit of what we might get into tonight. Um, finally, from very close to home, joining Nick and Eddie in conversation will be Colleen Lai, professor of English here at UC Berkeley, and most recently the editor with Chris Nealon of a collection of essays, After Marx, Literature, Theory, and Value in the 21st Century, which I hope you'll check out. Nick and Eddie, thank you so much for being with us here tonight, for being willing to talk with us and with one another, and for helping us celebrate the launch of this exciting project. Um, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Eddie, who I think is going to share screen and some images with us. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. And, and also thank you everyone over at Mir and, and congratulations on, on a successful launch. And as a former UC Irvine undergraduate student, I am very jealous. Um, I've sort of keep venturing more East Coast. So this really brings me to home. And, and some of the stuff I'll talk about today is really sort of Bay Area centric, I'll be dropping things right, like the Mission District, San Francisco Chinatown. And part of what I wanna talk about today and 
this is a book in 10 minutes. Um, what's great about this conversation is that I've been in solitude sort of writing the past year or two and recently had a book workshop. So it's great to sort of get some of these pictures out in public. Um, and that's part of what I want to do today is just to really show people in action um, because the people that I write about in my work and that I've had the privilege of interviewing um, are essentially people that were present at, you know, at Berkeley, at San Francisco State in 69. Um, but they're also activists who continued organizing into the 70s and 80s, whether it was um, in higher ed battles of Western Civ, of fighting for ethnic studies, but also most importantly of trying to create a, what they would call right a united front. And I might throw out some, some of the Marxist language and literature out there just given the group. Um, but they were, they were seeking to organize not only students, but they were trying to bring together students with laborers and even dabbling into electoral politics a little bit um, to try to bring about socialist communist revolution. Um, and part of what I have, I, I'm asking in the book is sort of um, what does communism look like at the personal level, um, as well as what happens when we look beyond the institution of the Communist Party USA, particularly studies that focus on the popular front or focuses on McCarthyism um, or the Red Scare, to instead try to um, shift the periodization a little bit to look at that post-68 moment or the sort of a moment of Black power, of the Chicano movement, of the Asian American identity movements, and see what happens or, or what activists, um, why they came to Marxism-Leninism as a sort of canon, but also as a way of, of organizing. Um, and what I found, and, and I'm trained originally as a Latino historian who dabbled a little bit, right, with comps and other fields, um, that I found that this history is not just a Latino history originally. And what I found was that Latino communists were merging with African Americans and Asian Americans to form this group, the League of Revolutionary Struggle. Part of a reason why they formed this organization is because they felt that the CPUSA by the 70s, obviously, of course, was not, was a shell of its former self and that a new party was needed. Part of what was needed for a new party in the, in the words of the League, of activists of the League was, one, it needed to be led by people of color. So the League was predominantly um, people of color with some estimates saying about 85 to 90 percent, um, whereas the organization was also led predominantly by women of color, particularly Asian women, um, Asian women who served as highest chairwoman and led various districts throughout California. And the, I say these two particular things because this is what makes the League a little bit different than some other Marxist-Leninist formations in the new communist movement that are coming more out of the Students of Democratic Society and more out of the white new left. The activists that I'm looking at and why I sort of think of them as homegrown or as grassroots or as organic is that many of these activists aren't born Marxist-Leninists, right? They originally came to activism via the, the Black Power Movement, the Civil Rights Movement, Chicano Movement, the Asian American Identity Movement as well, um, particularly because they realized, right, that the systems of capitalism and of imperialism were not just oppressing um, their own communities, but are oppressing the communities of their comrades. And so now the, the book is sort of, the, the questions are becoming right, like what is distinct about the 70s and the 80s? Um, what is different about this type of, of what communism meant to them? Um, and this is a fun sort of um, archive shot here of, of a pamphlet I found actually at Berkeley in the Ethnic Studies Library. Um, but I, I trace the story of the League, of course, a little bit further back. Um, using the work of people um, that, that have written about the third world left in San Francisco, as well as in Los Angeles. Um, I try to see, well, what were these activists doing in the 60s? And what I have found is that some activists become anti-police activists because of a case of known as Los Siete. Um, and not to, you know, be, not to spend a lot of time on this, but we see a couple of the themes I hope to bring out in the book, particularly around black and brown coalition building, uh, cross-racial uh, coalition building, but also what spurs people to activism. And in the case of Oscar Rios, who's the brother of Jose Rios, who's one of the seven men arrested um, in the late 60s in the Mission District, uh, wrongfully accused, is that there's, mess there, there's these two messages, right? A message from Huey Newton from the Black Panthers, who's also incarcerated at this time. And then there's a message about Jose Rios and the Rios family. A lot of the people organizing in La Siete de la Raza were students, um, students at places like San Francisco College, um, who begin organizing 
um, in their communities, right? Not to, we can talk more in, in sort of the, the Q&A about how their organizing is both local and then how they continue after they graduate from college. And that's part of the story I hope to tell is how the activists I'm writing about embody the spirit and carry the spirit of ethnic studies with them into the 70s, 80s, and later into life, um, where I won't spend a lot of time on the, the, the organizations that, that come before the league, but I want to stress a couple of things. One, you have activists from Los Siete and others from the Brown Berets, La Raza Unida Party, other major Chicano movement organizations creating the August 29th movement, which would go on to use, right, um, El Tercer Mundo, the Third World, Che Guevara. Um, they would have breakfast programs, but then they would find like-minded individuals from IWK or Iwar Kun, as well as later the Revolutionary Communist League, an organization known as the Congress of African People, famously led by Amiri Baraka, pictured on the left. Um, and so you have the case where these three different Marxist-Leninist formations within these three different ethnic identity movements each organically came to Marxism-Leninism, to internationalism, only after the local organizing that they were already doing um, in, their, in their backyards. Um, what brings these groups together are two different things I have found in oral histories with folks is the national question, which again, to a, a group of folks interested in Marxism, perhaps this might ring um, familiar, is that these groups were following in the tradition of other intellectuals, um, others from the Black radical tradition, um, others who had also thought about sort of, well, what is a Chicano national question or a Mexican-American national question, um, essentially thinking about internal colonialism. And so during this time, what I have found is that many of these pamphlets that I'm, that I'm using in my, my own work are often being used in some of the early ethnic studies journals as well. Some of those early articles out of ethnic studies are citing the research coming out of the community and vice versa. They, the, many of these pamphlets themselves, whether it's the August 29th movement, she got our national question, is citing some of the first journals of Aslan. So I try to treat um, these activists as the organic intellectuals as, that they are, right, as well as the activists. Um, so who are these people? And I know I got two more minutes left, so I'm, I'm really powering through. I just really, again, want to show sort of some faces to the people I'm talking about. Um, they include families um, like Reina Diaz, who is a retired farm worker, cannery worker in the San Jose area. Um, Gilbert Sanchez Jr., who his dad, Gil Sanchez Sr., will work in the auto industry. Um, Gil Sanchez Jr. himself will join the group as a member of uh, the East Los Angeles Community College Mecha organization, the Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Aslan. And in particular, what these activists are saying, right, is that they understand that liberation is going to come for all people um, because um, they, they see the overthrow of capitalism, right, as being important to being internationalist. So sort of the last couple slides I have just to sort of summarize um, the book takes the theme, the thematic approach of trying to see what the United Front was for the League. So how they brought together labor um, and the hotel and restaurant workers in Local 2 in San Francisco, the cannery workers in Watsonville, California, um, higher education activism at places like Stanford, as well as at Berkeley around Central American solidarity at, and um, Afri uh, apartheid. Um, and then as well, participating in the Jesse Jackson electoral politics campaigns of, the, of 84 and 1988, um, all while producing these important um, intellectual pieces. But also, I, I want to stress that the, the activists I'm talking about, although they were Marxist-Leninists, throughout the 80s, we see that the Marxism-Leninism perhaps is lost a little bit um, if we look at the newspapers. But I think what's important is that they recognize, right, uplifting people in labor struggles as well as in other struggles and recognizing that vanguardism in some ways was not gonna be the answer. Um, so I can talk more in the Q&A about some of the labor strikes they were a part of, as well as talking a little bit more, and this is sort of new area for me, um, is that many of the activists I write about are a part of a movement for an education bill of rights in the 1980s in California. Um, and develop sort of these marches on Sacramento um, for education that bring together again, right, Black student unions, Asian student unions, um, and others. And then here, um, just to sort of reiterate, they, they also work in electoral politics. We see Amiri Baraka here writing about the, the, the Jesse Jackson campaign, as well as Bill Gallegos, somebody mentioned on a previous slide. So overall, I just sort of, um, where I'm heading, 
is originally I thought this was going to be a book situated within Reaganism. Now it's sort of more thinking about neoliberalism and neoliberal institutions. Um, and I can talk more in the Q&A why I'm sort of starting to think about the, the rechanging of the thinking. But I really just want to say thank you again. And I can talk a lot more and I can talk for days and I, I don't want to take up any more next time. So I, I appreciate everybody for listening. I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eddie. And with that, I'll turn it over to Nick. Great. Um, thank you so much uh, to uh, to Lindsay, Alex, to Charmaine, uh, to Colleen, and to Joshua for organizing. And thank you also to Eddie. I'm really excited about this work. And I mean, I, I think that one of the things that I keep on returning to, and this is something that I've, I've returned to um, also in um, a piece that I really love of Colleen's um, about the Kambahi River Collective, uh, which is the lost um, understanding of theories of organization um, that underwrites so much of the leftist work that we see in this period. And so there, there, there is the th theoretical work <laughs> on, on one hand uh, that, that, that Marxism has been so important in doing, but it's also the very forms of organization and collectivity that enliven uh, that work and give that work meaning that it's so important to be able to, um, to recover and to engage with. And I think that those are some of the things that end up getting lost uh, when, when um, in a lot of um, return to the 60s and, and 70s movement, the, the organizational um, philosophies and imaginations um, that animated so much um, of that work. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my book, which um, engages the, those questions um, in a couple of different ways. So uh, my book project, long time coming, uh, is uh, Discipline and Surplus, Black Studies, Women's Studies, and the Dawn of Neoliberalism. And what it is, is a historical and theoretical study of two of the most significant left efforts to transform US higher education in the last half century or so. Um, and so one of the things the book argues is that properly historicizing Black studies and women's studies has been difficult. Um, and it's difficult partly because to historicize these things means rethinking the basic categories of university life in a moment when those very categories are in flux, when those, those categories are changing. And some of the ways in which those categories are changing are being addressed directly by the people who are building um, these fields. And simultaneously, these fields are being built, but they're being built from below and from above in different ways at the same time. And in some ways, the forms that were absorbed from above have been the, the most um, long lasting. Um, partly because, you know, you, you, you some, some, sometimes you fight to change the institution, but you're, you're also giving to the people you're fighting the ability to shape what you're asking for um, in the first place. And that becomes a major contradiction in the context of student movements. Student movements are fought for by students who are in the institution in order to leave the institution. Um, and so the very people who are fighting for the change are going to disappear by the very structure of them being there. Um, and so just understanding that as one of the fundamental contradictions that underwrite, underwrites student movements is um, part of the larger project that my, my book is trying to get at. So um, one of the things that it tries to ask is how can we tell a history of Black studies and women's studies that also asks a, the question of what the university is? <laughs> um, and in that, I think it offers an opportunity for a left theory um, and strategy and rethinking about what it means to, what it can mean to fight for the transformation of knowledge um, of the university, of, of the institution um, itself. So central to thinking through um, the emergence of Black Studies and Women's Studies is the category of a surplus. I don't have a lot of time to talk about surplus here. It, it, it takes a lot to, uh, to unfold it. Uh, but just generally speaking, when I'm thinking of surplus, I'm thinking of uh, people, places, and things that are ancillary, um, not involved directly 
but involved on the edges of capitalist production. There's a lot of nuance uh, there, um, but um, it's got a long history within um, Marxism, especially um, more recently in thinking about surplus populations, especially surplus populations are populations who are not involved in, not involved directly in capitalist productions. They can be, um, they can take different categories. The unemployed is uh, one of the kind of most uh, the most widely used categories to measure uh, surplus populations, uh, but there have been also different categories of surplus population. Uh, so if you think about the wages for house housework movement, the category of the housewife is also a category of population surplus. And so the Marxist feminist theory that uh, that um, unwaged labor in the home is so central to capitalist reproduction is an argument that the surplus population actually produces capitalism as such. So the, these ideas of, uh, of, of the surplus are really important to understand in the university. In my book, because I use them to talk about how the students and faculty who shape Black studies and women's studies actually came to be there in the first place. Um, so in order to understand these fields, we actually have to understand something about the political economy of the student, um, the student as a surplus population. Um, and so one of the things my book does is kind of frame the emergence of the student as surplus population on mass with the rise of um, higher education in the wake of the Second um, World War. It looks at the GI Bill, um, the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, as a major piece of legislation that effectively attempts to route around some of the, the issues um, that emerge in the wake of the First World War, um, many of us know about the um, the Bonus Army and some of the other political consequences to the the, uh, the fact that um, the race riots and the other kind of political consequences to the fact that there wasn't such an organized effort to reabsorb veterans into um, into the population after the war. So the GI Bill in its provisions for higher education does a really important thing in making it so that um, demobilized soldiers now have the opportunity to be absorbed into institutions of higher education. And in so doing, it also offers to them a wage. <laughs> it offers effectively a wage for students. It's from uh, 50 to $75 at, at the time, which is a pretty, pretty significant um, ranging on based on uh, whether a given veteran has a, has a family. Um, and so thinking about how higher education emerges to absorb surplus populations, has a really important, uh, really important function in uh, attempting to stave off various forms of social contradiction, social unrest, violence um, that were part of the consequences of the, the, the way that the veteran population was managed after the First World War. Um, it also has to do with the U.S.'s situation in the Cold War more broadly. The U.S. in the Cold War needs to demonstrate that capitalism does not inherently rely on unemployment, uh, the, the, the larger scale communist argument that capitalism doesn't inherently produce unemployment. So in elaborating structures effectively that take millions and millions of people off of the, um, out of the labor pool, um, out of the labor force um, without categorizing them as unemployment in which they are absorbed into institutions where they work for four or more years um, if they're not veterans without wages becomes a way of managing the economy and the economic contradictions of the Cold War. All these people who would otherwise be categorized as unemployed are now just recategorized as students. And it's that's how we get to the category of the student being a really crucial one for statecraft in the wake of the, the, the Second World War in a rolling fashion from veterans um, to the children of of post-war suburbanization. And ultimately, um, and this is something you can see in uh, a, a document like the, um, the Moynihan Report um, from 1965, 
um, there is a twinned injunction there to uh, send funds, and this is a, a, a report from, of course, the Department of Labor, um, to send funds into higher education, which ultimately helps to establish uh, educational opportunity programs uh, to establish upward bound um, that can make it so that Black people, um, and especially Black men, um, no longer are at the threat of being absorbed into the lumpen proletariat, <laughs> um, in, 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 into into um, the, the the part of the working class that is seen as potentially politically unruly, potentially absorbed into communist movements, um, potentially the source of rioting. Um, and so all of these things actually help to build the infrastructure um, through which uh, through which an unprecedented number of Black students are in colleges and universities uh, by the end of the decade. And so when we're talking about the third world strike at San Francisco State um, from 1968 to 69, when we're thinking about the conditions of possibility, we need to be thinking about those very basic questions around infrastructure that have to do with the absorption of sur surplus populations, but also how those people in the populations who are absorbed remake the conditions in which the, in the, the institution operates. Um, in many ways, that is not about resisting absorption. It's about reshaping the conditions in which absorption happens and also to re reshape the conditions in which in in terms of what it means to be a student uh, overall. And so the part of my my part of the book that's about black studies really emphasizes that the absorption of surplus populations also comes comes uh, hand goes hand in hand with efforts by students to reshape the conditions in which they're, they're absorbed. And in some ways, um, and I think that this this really comes uh, out in my chapter on the San Francisco State student strike. One of the ways they do is actually by creating a wage for themselves, by utilizing the infrastructure of the institution in order to create a, a wage for themselves and a, a wage for their communities. Um, and so this is th th this is kind of the the part part of the book that, that's about Black studies. Just to um, quickly move into the part of the the book that's about women's studies, the while. Oftentimes, Black studies and women's studies are talked about as kind of co-emergent. My book actually makes the case for thinking of the, their periodization slightly differently. Um, although some of the, the first department of women's studies was at uh, San Diego State in 1969, women's studies as a, a field with programs really didn't uh, start taking off until the mid-1970s. Um, and that has to, that that's a, an important um a important feature for explaining the shape of women's studies partly because women's studies expands in the wake of the recession of 1973 to 75 and also because the the uh the demographics in colleges and universities are uh really rapidly um shifting so for instance um by um, between 1970 and 1980, the number of men enrolled in U.S. colleges and universities uh, rose about 16 percent. Um, in that same period, um, the the um, increase in uh, women enrolled in universities was 85 percent. So between 1970 and 1980, for every one man enrolled in college, there were five women. And by the mid-decade, there were actually more women. Uh, the, the number of men enrolled in college ten, uh, actually starts to decline. And by the end of the decade, there are more women than men uh, en enrolled in, in U.S. colleges and, and universities. So for women's studies, one of the major things that emerges in that process is women becomes both uh, positioned as a uh, a minority, effectively as a minoritized population, but also as an emerging majority um, within with, within the context of um, within the context of the, of, of the university and a, a majority that can be leveraged to create other forms of justice without the same kinds of revolutionary struggle that traumatized the, the university in the beginning of, 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 the, of the period. And so uh, 
women's studies both responds to and is um, strategizes around some of the ways in which black studies programs, which were by 1975 in significant decline, um, declined by uh, some people it measured by the hundreds. Um, women's studies actually learns to survive be in, in a context in which uh, a more refer reformist relationship to difference uh, becomes the only re re really the, the conditions to um, to survive. And so women's studies expansion also becomes a way for the study of race and other forms of difference to live in different forms. So the, the book actually ends with talking about how the emergence of women of color actually uh, brings together different different uh, different contradictions that the field is navigating um, at at the time as well. There's a lot more to say there, but that's kind of an overview of what's going on in the book and what the stakes are and what the underlying um, the, the underlying conversations that it wants to um, engage in are. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I think, um, can you hear me? Uh, I'm going to jump in right now. Uh, uh, I'm Colleen Lai, uh, and I am charged with giving a sort of brief response, um, post some questions, and then uh, Nick and Eddie are going to go go at it uh, on their own without uh, with me stepping, stepping back. So um, there's so much here and uh, so much to say. So I, I'm just going to um, pull out what I think are some co uh, common threads that might be the basis for an interesting conversation and bring to some of my own questions um, as a um, sort of student of this period as well. Uh, super interesting. First of all, I just wanna say that it's such an exciting topic that both of you share because of thinking, because US third world Marxism um, is an American homegrown Marxism that's also an internationalist anti-racist Marxism. And those two things usually don't go hand in hand or traditionally we're not want to think of American and internationalism is two things that sit nicely together and that, that continues to be difficult, right? Um, how do you put those things together? Um, I think the historical interpretation of US third world Marxism of the 60s and 70s has such huge stakes for how we think about in particular anti-racism and anti-capitalist struggles today, how to link those two things. So there's so much, um, so much at stake in how we interpret that period. Um, so one of the things I, I want to ask you to, if you could talk more about, is your historical interpretation of this very crucial period of the 60s and 70s. And um, to sort of prompt you, I just wanted to lay out schematically, especially maybe for people who are not as, um, um, you know, wonky, uh, you know, uh, geeky about this whole period as we are, uh, to lay out two sort of opposite yet linked assessments of it. Um, sorry about that. Um, so um, Max Elbaum who I think uh, um, Eddie you'd refer to, um, has authored the only in-depth book still on the new communist movement. And it's written from a revolutionary Marxist-Leninist perspective, therefore much more sympathetic to the late new left than liberal new left accounts like Todd Gitlin's, right? So that's one of the big things that Elbaum um, managed to um, um, afford us when he first wrote that book. And he diagnoses the NCM's breakdown is due to what he calls a miniaturized and therefore cari caricature Leninism that tried to build a revolution in the air. Now, Elbaum is writing from a kind of rectificationist side of history, meaning anti-anti-revisionist, sorry, meaning that in the end, um, sort of pro-Soviet, even though he moved through the, the pro-third world side, meaning that for a while he was on the China side of that Sino-Soviet split. And so you could say that by the 1980s, right, he is um, coming, he's he's kind of skeptical of what the NCM, um, you know, was about, it sort of saw in it a kind of inevitable devolution because of its miniaturized Leninism. And some of the fights had to do with basically investing a lot of hope um, in the new social movements afforded by Glasnost from within the actually existing socialisms of the East Bloc. OK, so that's where he is and his group is by the 80s. We could say, on the other hand, I'm just going to, for schematic purposes, put at the other end of um, uh, from him an assessment of the 60s and 70s NCM, Robin D.G. Kelly, OK, who comes out of the Communist Workers Party and NCM and NCM organization. And therefore, I would say he's more on the China side of the Sino-Soviet split. 
Um, and he had this to say recently uh, in a discussion actually with Vijay Prashad. I'm sorry if you can hear my dog in the background. Oh, um, uh, discussing um, Walter, Walter Rodney actually, where he says, Famously, uh, you know, well, this has been discussed um, that historical materialism has run its course, but not dialectical materialism. Uh, and in that in that sentence, in that discussion with Vijay Prashad, Kelly is equating historical materialism with an orthodox, aka Soviet Marxist stages view of history, to which Kelly is counterposing a dialectical materialism, which he associates with th the third world Marxisms of Rodney, Cabral, Baraka, but also the surrealist imagination of Walter Benjamin. So this discussion was also picked up recently in the Malcolm Effect podcast with any Olaloki Tariba, right? So for, for Kelly, there's like this through line from uh, Benjamin to Baraka. And so I would say, interestingly, there's a kind of, I would characterize and maybe, you know, I'd be interested to hear your take, um, Kelly as having a kind of anti-Leninist Marxist perspective, like something that's more on the kind of soft Maoist side of things coming through that formation of the CWP. Okay, so, so that is to say both Elbaum and Kelly are or were revolutionary Marxists, but in practical terms, all that was left by the 1980s in some ways was to throw in with the Rainbow Coalition and a long march through the institutions in practical terms. So to be a Leninist or an anti-Leninist at that point in the 1980s kind of didn't really matter in terms of what kind of comportment you took vis-a-vis -vis US state politics, but the difference left its imprint uh, theoretically on how subsequent generations of US leftists were to conceptualize the relationship between imperialism, racism, and capitalism the absence of actually existing socialisms and the kind of waning of the party form as an operative factor in US politics. So I'm really interested, Eddie and Nick, and what your take is on the 80s, because it's just this kind of weird period where the LRS exists. There's, you know, it has an ethnic studies formation. There's an Occupy University movement. Um, it's There's still kind of recent memory of new social movements and the party, uh, various parties and the NCM experience. What I think is really great about the work that both of you are doing with your books is that you're doing original historical research into this period and not just working with sort of hand me down theoretical assumptions that many of us who come after this period um, kind of inherited because we're working with giants, right? Like these are people who kind of were activists. They were in the movements and they wrote amazingly important intellectual histories and you know original work. Um, and so. Um, I'm wondering, bringing your historical perspectives from this moment to that crucial period of the 60s through the 80s, what are you thinking about the relationship between the university and social movements? Um, um, what does it mean to approach these theoretical questions, anti-racism and anti-capitalism, or race and class, freed from party dictates, but, um, and that, but um, meaning that we're um, unmoored in a way from practical politics, it's, it's freeing. We're not worried about the Stalinist dictate or, right? But, but also becoming academicized and by which I don't mean dismissively in the same way that Nick, Nick you're asking us to take the university space really seriously. So I, I think there's a way in which that gets um, dismissed to, to be academicized is somehow to be purely theoretical. It does become grounded in university politics, which includes thinking about the student as a truly revolutionary agent, perhaps potentially, but also limited um, by the fact that it's within the university space. And, you know, so what does it mean that political factions get played out as inter and intra departmental fights, professional fights, disciplinary fights? I think that's kind of the post actually existing socialist legacy of a kind of theoretical Marxism still trying to navigate um, um, these isms in the wake of uh, the long 60s. So, so just to sum up, I would just say I'm curious whether you have a different diagnosis of the devolution of US third worldism from the 60s to the 80s compared to the extant dominant interpretations and what are those implications of your different diagnosis um, uh, for the relationship between anti-racism and anti-capitalist struggle today, right? So important for all of us um, on the one hand and then on the other hand, how do you think about the relationship between anti-imperialism anti-racism and the university as a space of struggle. So those are the two questions. Thank you. I, 
I way think to start. <laughs> off now, yeah. I mean, so I, I, I have the place that my book ends is um, with the publication of um, Sheree Moraga and Gloria Anseldua's uh, This Bridge Call My Back. Um, so early 80s. Um, and at the moment, it's being the moment the book is published. Um, Moraga and Anseldua are both teaching as adjuncts um, at San Francisco State. Um, and so there, there are just a, a lot of different iterations of, of San Francisco State that re reemerge in the book as different articulations um, of, of, of third worldism. Um, but at the, at the same time, uh, it's incredible it, it's increasingly difficult to make a living for the students at san francisco state um for the people who are teaching classes at, at, at san francisco state and the writings that you see in this bridge call my back document um what feels like a, a crisis of having to pull the conditions of thought and praxis out of places where they, th th those those conditions are uh, increasingly scarce. And so by, by, by the 1980s, um, partly partly because of the recession, but car partly because of the the aggressive um, aggressive budget cuts and defunding of various um, institutions, partly because um, the increasing cost of living um, in a lot of spaces where collectivity is be being produced, um, there is n the, the the very conditions for that. People in the late 60s who were building these kinds of third world Marxism could kind of take for granted um, the, the, the conditions that make living, breathing collectivity possible are not in place in the same way um, or being scrapped together in the same way. Um, are in, in, in different ways. Um, and I, I think that that has actually some pretty deep implications for, um, for these questions, especially in the, the ways that, that they end up um, entering the universities, because the people who elaborate the fields are actually people who are most likely to be positioned um, in entirely different ways than Moraga and Nantaldua. Um, so San Francisco State, the, the the third world strike there was really on the faculty level was fomented by a lot of people who were teaching uh, part-time or full-time off the tenure track. Um, and the, 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 those people by, by the early 1980s are moving between multiple universities in, in order to try and basically get, get, get by. Um, and so the, the infrastructure that made those, the, some of the questions possible and the formations possible possible, uh, the, the actual surplus labor time uh, that makes the conditions of, of, of thought po po possible and, and the co those conditions of collectivity are really beginning to fray infrastructurally. Um, and so just seeing, like, I, I think that, like, as a, a basic question about what's happening in the 80s, that seems like really, really um fundamental. I think there's also something fascinating ideologically that I, I don't know what to make sense, make sense of. It's a like, this is a, a book two question, but it has to do with how the, how the idea of vanguardism serve, or the, the practices of vanguardism survive without the idea or theory of the vanguard <laughs> um and so like there's so many of the 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 reflexes of vanguardism that characterize uh the academic left absorption of left ideas that don't actually that, that are the 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 actually the um the reflexes of vanguardism but they don't under, uh, understand themselves as vanguard so the idea that the most oppressed people are the most author, authority uh, authoritative in speaking this is a a deeply vanguardist idea <laughs> that uh, oftentimes is the common sense of university organizing uh so so common sense that no one 
actually needs to speak it in a lot of different contexts and that generations of activists have been trained in today, but without the, the actual political tradition or, and, and I, like I would complain a little bit, some of the, the sense of responsibility um, that, that, that comes with like, you know, with the vanguard, vanguardist gesture. And so I think there, there's so much interesting that's happening in the university as a site of reproduction of ideas that absorbs some kinds of uh, like important reflexes of political tendencies, but without the encompassing frameworks, the, the larger encompassing frameworks or the means of reproducing those frameworks, because those means of reproducing those frameworks are part of what's fraying at the time. So when I, I read the 80s, I, 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 I read it through those kinds of th those sets of contradictions where there is a certain kind of success. Uh, there is a certain kind of absor absorption and it's important. It's important for the, the ability of these ideas to to continue like continue living and <laughs> there's more there as well um of course you know with the the um really devastating um political terrain that's being negotiated there yeah i'll, I'll sort of pick up there um thank thank you nick uh, definitely i i think um part of the some of the stuff about the 80s is like new to me in the sense of Originally, I, I think I might have mentioned it earlier too, where originally the, the title of the book had Reaganism in the title and actually Robin Kelly was uh, was recently a reviewer of the book and he was like, I don't, I don't like Reaganism in the title. Like, I don't like it. And part of the point he was trying to get me to think about was that, you know, neoliberal policies predate Reagan. At first I was like, you know, Reagan's California, then Reagan's America just thinking through sort of 68 and, you know, California activism and then thinking, connecting it to the 80s with sort of Reagan's Calif uh, Reagan's America. And then I realized what, what Robin was trying to get me to think about, right, was the the shifting in, neo in institutions and sort of neoliberalism, both as, as a broader sort of project and then changes in capitalism, but neoliberalism also in changes in collectivity and collectivity the way that we relate to each other, the types of organizations we have, um, and sort of the damage that neoliberalism wreaked on sort of some of these organizations, right? And I think at first, uh, oftentimes when I talk about the league, right, I'm very sympathetic and, and this is the historian hat on here, right? Where people always call me a cheerleader and they're always like, you have this non-declensionist narrative about the eighties. And, and part of that now I, I wear sort of with my, with my heart on my sleeve, because I do think that Part of the story of the 80s is that the institutions that people were up against in the 80s were so powerful and that I do think that some of the only ways that folks were able to earn some of these gains, right? And, and the book more and more becomes has become stories of victor, small victories in the sort of Reagan's America in this neoliberal society because I do think um, when we look at the labor movement, um, Lane Windham and a lot of other historians have sort of tried to get us to think differently about the labor movement. That, it, yes, we know labor is going to lose and labor is up against these very, you know, runaway factories, deindustrialization, the stories we all know. But at the same time, when we look at people of color, when we look at women, uh, we see a vibrant labor movement in the 70s and 80s. And I, and I sort of see that, too, with, with um, higher education activism in some ways as well, where we do, and I agree with everything Nick is saying, right, the way we're, we're, we think about 68, 69. Um, I also recently have been thinking about um, 78 and 79 lately, which are about the, the Bakke decision, the Bakke court case that goes up at 76, California Supreme Court, 78, later the, the, the bigger court. But, you know, we're still seeing those battles over affirmative action today. Battles over higher uh, ethnic studies requirements. Uh, I don't think I spent time on the, on the image, but this is a battle that's going on today, right? These are sort of these, these asks of these institutions that I think are still being made that I think actually is a part of the story about the way that institutions and structures reformulate themselves um, and change the, the, the conditions, right? But particularly back to the 80s, um, I do think that you know, some of what Max is saying in the new communist movement, uh, um, revolution in the air is, is very important. Um, particularly, I was just talking to someone, I was uh, doing some research in New York last week and, or this week, actually, it's been last week. Yeah, it's like a train ride for the first time. Californian living on the East Coast for the first time. I'm enjoying every bit about it. Um, but what I, what I was talking, I was able to talk to a former activist in the organization, somebody that was a high leader 
Um, and, and part of what they were saying was like, look, the Marxism Leninism was there, but we were organizers. Like we were, you know, we were already organizing before we were Marxist Leninists. And that sort of, for me, it was like, a, aha, like that's what I've been thinking about and, and what other people have been saying. But I think that that sort of became a big question for a lot of the left in the 80s of, you know, are we just working for the Jesse Jackson Democratic Party campaign? Um, what do we do? And I think part of it was that that was the movement in a lot of ways for some Marxist Leninists, partially because, right, a lot has been destroyed already. And another part, and this is this is new to me, this is something I talked with somebody this week, right, is that the fervor of the Jackson movement was, was actually powerful in the sense, at least for them personally, that they felt that it was, if you were going to follow the masses to kind of bring it back to the vanguardism, like if you're going to follow the masses and you're going to lead with the masses, then and the Jackson campaign was where they believe the, the masses were, at least for the activists in the league that I spoke with. And they felt the same with higher education. And this will sort of be what I want to, what I want to finish with is they kind of were the people that saw EOP, that saw sort of these various administrative positions, even after they graduated and 69, 70, 71 from Hayward or from other campuses, they would get jobs, right? The School of Public Health at Berkeley. Um, there's some very important activists that have gone through there. Um, but then also, and, and, and like this is, I mean, for me, this is the story of Marxism, Leninism, at least in my book, um, is, you know, there was faculty, there was both faculty and staff, staff folk at Berkeley there in the late 80s willing to help new younger students in the that were undergraduates with things like tutoring with things like even smaller things like hey did you do your homework today before you can go out and be an activist right um and so those are, are the stories that i hear from the oral history side of things that sort of tell me what marxism leninism meant to to folks on a, on a personal level um during a challenging time of the 80s right where you, where there is the world was on fire. The world's always on fire, right? But but uniquely in the, the, the 80s, at least that we're talking about right now. Um, unless unless either of you would like to say anything else, maybe at this point we can open it up, open up the floor to other questions. Um, we're going to try and bring in a number of different li lines of questioning here. Uh, so there's the chat. Feel free to put a question in the chat, and uh, either Lindsay or I will read it out. Um, there will also be questions coming in from YouTube, I think, into the chat. And uh, feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to um, ask a question yourself. Cindy has a question uh, for Nick. Do you have any thoughts on the relationship of socialist feminist organizations to the development of women's studies and how this produced a different kind of disciplinary form for formation? Also a hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I think that just very concretely, um, one, one thing I would direct you to is, nine, I think it's a 1974 document from the UC, not UC, the San Diego State, then it's university, um, women's studies program called so, uh, Women's Studies and Socialist Feminism. Um, it basically wa was a document created by a, um, a student and non-student collective of activists who um, collectively quit, <laughs> uh, qu quit their role in, in, in the women's studies, uh, department, partly like, because there was this effort, especially because, San, you know, of, of the, the California state colleges, the, the most, um, ardent, uh, can, the campus that really wanted the status of university most was San Diego State, and it it, it fought it fought tooth and nail through, throughout the '60s. Malcolm Love really wanted the moniker of a university for San Diego State. He thought he thought that San Diego State was an exceptional um, institution w w w within the system. And so, one of the things that, that that they were attempting to do was to formulate the women's studies uh, department as one run by faculty 
all with PhDs. They were offering lines and, and resources, but this also meant prying it away from a more uh, student-led activist, socialist, feminist base for um, a, a department. And so I, I, I don't think that that was the end in, by any, any means of, of, of socialist feminism within women's studies, but that was one, a, a department that through a lot of different struggles, because some of the founding members of that, that, that department did not at all identify as socialist feminist. But um, one where that that um, struggle is being um, articulated with um, with particular force. There's also a really great uh, piece from I think the first first issue of Signs um, by Linda Gordon, um, which is basically a socialist feminist response to the, the 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 theory of women's studies and the question of whether women's studies is a, a revolutionary um, a revolutionary formation for uh, to which uh, Gordon's uh, response is pretty, uh, pretty absolutely no, <laughs> uh, no, 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 no chance, um, uh, in hell. And so I, but I, I think that th there are different ways that the, the socialist feminist idea kind of ends up getting rearticulated through the, the field, um, of women's studies, both overtly and, um, and more more covertly, um, it's just that, that, that I, I think by the 1980s it, it is not in overarching um, overarching framework or one that has direct relationship with with any particular organizations that I know of. I'm sure there are examples that I don't, um, and so that, that's kind of my, my sense of how it. Um, how it develops over the course of 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 the 70s and 80s the other thing i will say is just with women's studies the initiators of programs and departments were much much more likely to be faculty members than in black studies or or in ethnic studies um and so the the by the turn of the 1970s the 29ish percent of faculty in universities are women so it's a significant minority but it's still like it's still a significant number and many of them are the people who actually fight to start the first women's studies classes and by mid-decade are um are are kind of the are establishing the first uh programs although uh students play play an important role in that as well so i think that that Kind of helps to account for some of the difference is differences in organizational uh, landscape uh, politically in women's studies versus uh, you know the direct relationship to third world and third worldist uh, orgs that you see in some black studies and, and ethnic study pro programs, though by no means all. A question from Felice. Hi, Nick. <laughs> Hi, nice to hear and see you. And thank you, Eddie and Colleen, for your incredible comments. This has been a really, really extraordinary conversation. So I just happened to be finishing an article about this bridge. So this has been just really timely. But my question for you all is about what has really become a critique of terms like women of color, BIPOC, POC, et cetera. So it seems almost to me that, you know, if there was an idea about theory in the flesh, right, from Moraga, today um, there's much more critique of these efforts to create these kind of collectivizing uh, terms that historically, as you all were describing, that kind of solidarity was so crucial to the thinking. So in part, my idea has been that a part of that, you know, call it neoliberal or, you know, absorption, I think is the phrase that Nick was using. A part of that has been really trying to take the ideas and disappear the bodies. But this is, again, running counter in part to designations like Hispanic serving institutions, you know, so on and so forth. So I'm just wondering about you know, that uh, in relation to, you know, what, again, increasingly feels like an emphasis on um, the specificity of one group, as opposed to trying to collectivize 
uh, groups under umbrella terms like POC. So I'm just wondering uh, your thoughts about that, given your research and the way that you're bringing this to a conversation about institutional formations now. And thank you again. I, I can sort of step in. Um, I, I'll sort of say, um, I, I've actually heard it now in a few times, a few spaces where I've, I've had the privilege to, to talk about the league, is actually um, people wondering if I'm doing the, if I'm doing the job for the right, like if I'm actually revealing the cultural Marxists um, that have, you know, in, uh, integrated themselves in all these institutions and as politicians as you know some of the folks that I that I write about become mayors some of them become the early the professors that are high up in Ivy Leagues that are also in other institutions uh, of higher ed um so I, I'll sort of say that I, I do think in some ways um what I think is unique about the folks I write about is that they were Marxists but they were influenced by cultural nationalism. And they try to do this thing where they sort of bring the two together, which I think led to different camps sort of disagreeing what they were doing, meaning sometimes in the Chicano movement stuff, the League actually faced backlash on top of being a secret organization, which I won't get into detail. Um, they, they, they had a lot of enemies and opponents and some of those enemies came from within the Chicano movement who claimed that these, these league people were outsiders because they were Marxists, right? Because they were, you know, following a European or a white foreign ideology that was somehow not, you know, from within the communities is that I found that Marxism actually for these folks gave them the opportunity to collectivize around that, that working class or around that sort of um, solidarity, right? Um, so for my answer, it's sort of, I, I, I don't know, um, because I do think that they they were critiqued by Marxists as well for be wearing their, their sort of race and ethnicity on the, as a point of pride. Um, so I'll say that for some in the league, they, they, they struggled to figure it out, how to, you know, build some of those bridges. And they, that's why they did try to work with sort of liberals and politicians and and trying to create that united front version um so i think that that there's always they had that challenge and then um i think with the institutional formation stuff that they that that sort of is what happened for a lot of them is that for a lot they sort of the the institution of the league itself sort of resulted in needing to not be a secret organization anymore, which needed folks to out themselves publicly, which led to the institution actually um, dissolving. The group falls apart when the conversation becomes, should we become open Marxist? Should we become open communist after the fall of the Soviet Union? And, and what I want to say is that that sort of brought on the nonprofit industrial complex, which I don't know where that fits into the whole turning point from the 1980s to the 1990s. Like I'll use one example, the Chinese Progressive Association in San Francisco, for example, goes from an organization that was a mass organization to a nonprofit organization. And I'm not one that's in these debates and these battles, but I know that there's folks today that are asking, well, what was lost, what was gained by that sort of nonprofit shift, right? Um, so I'll sort of, I talked a lot for someone that did not answer the question fully, but more so to say that I think that, that that it's an important question to be asked because I do think that people are looking to the 80s and are looking towards the, what the Marxists of the 80s were saying and they are that is the language that is being used right for anti-communism today even um, just sort of the way that folks integrated themselves in these institutions in the 80s I guess from the perspective of the league they were successful in a lot of ways and I, I I'm not outing anybody from the league tonight but they yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I would say that it's it, it's it's really tricky because part, part, like one of the questions ends up being what what terms survive. Um, so you, you you look at uh, this bridge called my back, and um, one of the things that Moraga really wants to hold on to is this um, 
alignment of women of color with radicalism with third worldism um and so there's the effort to maintain that that, that that alignment which is important to her politically and if you look at the 1983 preface the uh the thing that she's really kind of underlining there is one the the, the difficulty of maintaining that, that that alignment especially uh to get back to colleen's point in the context of trying to infuse the the aspiration toward third worldism with internationalism with anti-imperialism um at at that moment and in part i think that there are incentives incentives to disappear um a lot of those um a lot of those kinds of relationships to um radical political cur currents to anti-imperialism and if not disappear just to de- um, de-emphasize. And I think that the, there are consequences to those kinds of, um, gestures, um, in many ways. I think that there's like all nomenclature is coalitional, <laughs> um, in, 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 in the end, it's all known nomenclature is also the outcome of compromises, um, ultimately, but I think the, the, the dynamic fleece that you're, you're pointing out, um i think is there is there from the start <laughs> with, with with all of all, all of this language ethnic studies becomes ethnic studies after not being third world studies um and now we're, we're now we're still like we're fighting in various places to actually have the right to do ethnic studies as well and so these the the, 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 the struggles end up mattering a lot, but part of it has to do with ha like how you can live your politics in public. Um, you know, Angela Davis get, gets outed as a member of the the, the Communist Party, and um, in 1969, and has so many death threats that the the police stop uh, actually responding to the, the, the death threats, and she has to learn to uh, check her car for car bombs herself. Her uh, dissertation advisor Herbert Marcuse uh, gets death threats regularly, so many that he has to actually move out of his his home in. In, in San Diego, um, and they don't know if he's going to uh, rejoin the faculty in the beginning of the, the 19, 1969 school year. Um, and so they're like, even when it's no longer uh, considered against institutional policy to be a communist, or you can be a Marxist, but not a communist. Um, and the, there are these like very, very fine lines uh, to do a lot of, of, of institutional building work, sometimes losing that public part of your identity means that it, in in the transmission, the actual political understandings that underwrote the work that you do don't survive, which is why I think it's so important to, as I've said a couple of times here, to really try and work on recovering the 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 theory of organization that enlivened the political work that we don't that has survived as work, but has not necessarily survived as work that was imagined to fit within a larger theory of organization. And I, th I think that 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 that's really, um, I, if anything, I think one of the, the the crucial conversations to be able to have, like, what did people imagine the shape of the political world looked like through the work that they that that they did um and i think it's hard because that's that that's exactly what has to disappear um in, in order for the work to end up getting published or to get institutionalized or to get archived in a lot of ways so there, there's a real kind of fundamental contradiction in all that as well thank you thanks so much uh, next question from diane Okay, I was muted. Um, thank you so much. This is really an exciting conversation. I feel so energized by this. Um, I do research myself on Asian American radicalism and so feel very aligned with the work that you're doing and really appreciate Colleen, you're just such insightful and generative comments. Um, and I have a question for each of you. Um, to Eddie, I'm, I, I've heard about you're doing this research on the league and 
um, wow, I, I could imagine how difficult it is. Um, and I am actually curious about where you left off about kind of what it's like to interview people and how they're receiving you. But I think that that might be a question for an offline conversation and I hope we can have that. And my question right now more is wondering if you could articulate more the ideology of the league um, because I think that the uh, particular ways that they were thinking about race, nation, class, right, U.S. third world Marxism, which differs somewhat than from, say, Max Elbaum's views, were really important and I think instrumental to helping us think very clearly about um, meanings of racism and anti-racism today, which I think are kind of all over the place, right? A national in relation to national liberation, in relation to capitalism and anti-imperialism. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to that and what their politics are and then their ideology and how that um, has implications for today. And then Nick, I was interested in your ideas around absorption and thinking about the GI Bill, but I'm also thinking about the master plan of 1960, right? And the ways that that was also very much about developing workers to build the defense economy in the United States post-war, right? Um, and wondering if you could speak to that as well as the ways that kind of more the politics of the political economy, like how this shifts from civil rights movement to black power then shapes the kind of ideologies that grow out in, in, in the third world liberation fronts. <clears throat> you wanna go for a snack or? <laughs> <laughs> you you go right ahead. <laughs> thank, thank you, Diane. And, uh, definitely, um, your your work has been so important and and has shaped so much of of what I hope to do. And and um, actually, just planned a archive trip down to Yukon actually to the the Fred Ho papers um, soon. So being being out here has been nice to get me to where I need to go. Um, what I, what I'll say is sort of um, very briefly. Uh, I think somebody in the comments was asking. Um, sort of something about um, loudspeaker versus sharing tactics. And, and, and that's something that I sort of think a lot about, um, particularly because since a lot of the activists I do write about are still active today, um, it, it makes it a, a difficult story to tell in part because I feel like a conspiracy theorist sometimes where I'm kind of like, oh yeah, like, oh, that person was in the league. Or like, oh, that person was in the league. Or it has become sort of a part of the story that other people will tell me, you know, I was an I was organizing with them when they were in the league or so it's a it's a hard I, I think I came sort of 20 years after Max's book and, and there's other um, graduate students right now and other professors in the room in the in the chat too that I've seen um, that are working on, on on histories of the league as well and I think that we we are lucky in that it's 20 years after Max's book is published, um, which his book, I will say, right, that it, he preserves a lot of names in that book. And then now I know, at first as a graduate student, I was like, why is there no names in this, right? And as I sort of realized that it's because there's the ethical sort of question, right, about outing people's lives and red baiting people. And, and so that's partially why I haven't mentioned anybody's name. So sort of answer the question about the politics of some of the folks in the league, I think that Part of it is since they were veterans of, you know, these racial ethnic identity movements is that part of their driving motivator, particularly thinking of the labor movement, but also in general was sort of, they believed in sort of the, that the oppressed peoples or, or the, the lower stratum of the working class and, and they used lower stratum to define sort of, you know, folks like Canary and hotel service sector um, and other sort of um, sectors of labor as sort of the, the, there needed to be a sort of unification of these two movements, the oppressed nationalities movement and the labor movement. So um, they viewed sort of working class politics in relation to sort of um, oppressed third world peoples. Um, and so the league really tried to implement some of these things, right, by trying to organize in particular labor struggles where they got in with, with the Watsonville Canary workers because they they decided to organize, and it's not just the League Right, it's the new com other new communist movement organizations, other groups like the CPML, the October League, the all the alphabet soup. Um, but I think the Watsonville case is a good sort of implication of their politics in that they they 
were excited about Watsonville because it was predominantly immigrant women labor. And they thought that this is where the labor, the, the organized labor movement needed to be paying attention, right? The cannery workers who are speak are from Mexico, the hotel service restaurant workers who are from the Philippines, who are from um, other other nations. And, and so they they there was big Marxism, right? This is the big revolution. And then there was little Marxism, everyday Marxism and the the sort of the translating link, uh, contracts from English to Spanish for the first time in union history, English to Tagalog and other languages. And so um, I, I would say sort of that I think is for me the, the, the heart of part of their theory. And then the other sort of parts that I have not had the chance to talk about is sort of um, the belief that race and ethnicity was essential to the conversation of class, right? And so the the linking together of what we all know, and, and this is in a long tradition of other Marxists of color too, right? Claudia Jones is of the world and others about intersectionality, about triple oppression. Um, so I would say sort of adding a little bit of that ideology. And if there's folks in the audience that would like to add more, <laughs> definitely please. And I'd love to talk more soon. <laughs> One of my favorite things about about Max, Max Elbaum's book is just that it talks about rent, <laughs> um, that it talks about living situations among leftists. It's like who live with whom under under what conditions and what what configuration and what why the, those shifts in living conditions uh, actually played a really really important part in in political formations um, at the time and it talks how much talks in some places about how much money people made doing what um, if anyone who's watching this is going to think about writing a memoir I really think that those kinds of those details are so important. It matters a lot that Angela Davis tells you what her rent is in San Diego, in LA, uh, in her autobiography, and it allows so many of those details to be able to put together about the overall questions um, of, of 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 political economy that that are um, that are playing out. Um, at that moment, especially for people who are trying to make uh, figure out how the, the, those conditions, um, the conditions that, in which people get by shift. Um, and so I, I think that is really at the heart of one of the questions I, I get into around the, the master plan to get to D Diane's um, question, which is, by 1960, which is the year, the year the kind of the legislation that we know of as as the California Master Plan for Higher Education is passed, um, there's newspaper articles talking about how for um, for every one person graduating from high school, there are two people in second grade. Um, so what they're anticipating is just this, like the baby boom is going to create an unemployment crash that has, that, that, that is not precedented. And so th there are like the thing that I, I really think is crucial in the master plan is the hierarchical organization of institutions you have the community college com colleges that are open to everyone the uh california state colleges which are open to like the top third of every class and then the ucs which are uh, uh, open to the top 12.5 uh percent of of high school um graduates and so th this is both a plan that is about um the absorption project of um, pulling in uh, the the population surpluses that they are they are anticipating already in second grade uh, coming from th coming through in second grade, but also in differentiating them um, in the kinds of resources, the, the kinds of uh, opportunities, the kinds of localities that they'll they'll, they'll have um, open to them, the geography, uh, the geographies in which. Uh, different populations are going to be able to um to operate and part of that is about 
as as you mentioned, especially with the, the the UCs being research research based institutions, that's part of what gets clarified through the master master plan. The UCs do research. <laughs> the uh, other other institutions of higher education are not tasked with, with research, and that has to do with who gets defense dollars, um, and who who is eligible to do, to apply for defense dollars, and who are the who are the people applying for defense dollars uh, are in competition with um what what the shape of that that that, that competition um ends up ends up looking like um and then all those other kind of intra institutional um relations now a lot of that ends up breaking down mid 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 1960s because of the the emergence of educational opportunities programs and so many of the things that um presidents um especially at san francisco state um because that that's definitely the place where leftists uh like even by the beginning of the 60s had the the most significant um leverage um there ends up being in, immense pr uh, pressure on the presidents of the institution and san, san san francisco state has eight different presidents from 1960 to 1970 so the, the the various presidents of the of the institution to um use discretionary powers to pull in uh, groups of students who wouldn't traditionally or by, by, by the criteria of the, the master plan uh, be eligible um, to be to enter the, those colleges. And that's how um, the tutorial program with Black and Latinx students in at San Francisco State really ends up getting the a lot of students who otherwise wouldn't end up being eligible for college to uh, to go to co college. Um, as well um in the middle the, the civil rights struggle for both for for black students and white students at at san francisco state is fascinating and the shift from civil rights to black power um in some ways is a, a shift in the overall racial constitution of of who does those politics um and so like th there were there were significant numbers of white students involved in civil, civil rights work in San Francisco, uh, San Francisco State in the early um, 1960s. Um, the Negro Students Association gets established, I think, 1965 or 66 by Mariana Wadi. Um, then two years later, that becomes the Black Student Union. Um, Jimmy Garrett is one, one of the presidents of the, 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 the Black Student Union. Uh, but by the time he's president, that's like like 67, 68, it's not necessarily, it's not yet a Black Power organization. Um, it's really around 68, Garrett graduates, um, and uh, Benny Stewart and Jer Jerry Venardo and a couple of other people uh, take over the, the institution. Uh, George Mason Murray, who is the uh, Minister of Information for the Black Panther Party, um, of course, is uh, an English instructor, gets fired at the beginning of the 1968, um, the, the 1968 school year by the um, the California State College Board of Trustees. And then from there, uh, after being fired, he calls for the student strike um, at San Francisco State. So that that shift does really end up mattering sig significantly for a few a few different ways, but it's not necessarily a really direct transfer between civil rights and black power as much as it is different people in different organizational positions that um, kind of reconfigure the, the, the political orientation of 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 those orgs um, internally. Um, and that's just that's just one example i think you know in uh san fernando valley state which is um you know san, san, in valley state w one of the th like is a really great example of the ways in which uh prosecutorial strategy shifts in order to try and um really profoundly um demobilize student movements by the end end of the decade there's a one point when i think 35 students in the black student union get charged with over a thousand felonies um <laughs> like in, like in response to a pro protest to just completely drown them in in red tape which eventually the alioto um regime in san francisco takes up and decides we instead of allowing students to uh students who have been arrested to fight their 
cases collectively, we're going to prosecute every single one individually and make every single one mount an individual defense that 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 may end up competing with someone else's defense and have it so that either they're they're under resourced and or they're they're competing um, with each other, and so like th th these different co different contexts actually really shape the the institutional pressures um, in in pretty profound ways as well. Thanks so much for those responses. We have a couple of questions. Um, the first of which is from Luke. Um, it's a question for Nick. Do you have any thoughts on how the different disciplinary formations in women's studies versus black studies might have affected their recept uh, respective receptions of intersectionality as a defining framework? Um, he says, I'm thinking specifically on, along the lines of Jennifer C. Nash's work, but I'd be interested in a specifically um, Marxist or political economic perspective on the issue. Um, also, thank you both for the wonderful, wonderful talks, by the way. Thanks for, um, for the question, Luke. I have no I, like I, I don't have anything formulated um, except just to say that I think that um, the way that women's studies is is organized by the late '80s and then grows in in the '90s, um, as well as its relationship because of the humanities orientation um, of a lot of a, a lot of its practitioners means that it is able to when it establishes departments really uh, have an autonomous space for theory in a way that the resource structures that that, that, that are aligned with black studies departments don't necessarily uh, allow for this has to do with uh, like a lot of different things like that that fact that you know uh 30 percent of the professory it's women by the the, the, the the turn of the 70s means that there are by the 80s actually a significant number of white women with a decent enough quantity of institutional power to make 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 things happen and that's just not necessarily the case with with people who are practitioners in black studies the other thing is that uh phil philanthropic institutions really made it a point of not supporting black studies formations that were going to be departmentalized um and so the 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 department of black studies was seen as a, a nationalist thing that needed to be avoided at all cost which meant that having an internal institutional um rationale for your your, your department's existence or a methodologically differentiated uh differentiated body of practice and theory didn't really happen except in a few places um Temple University being the most the the most notable place and that's why the one of the most like most powerful units of black studies actually was the 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 university that uh, Malefi Asante elaborated the theory of Afro afrocentricity um in so there there are kind of material contexts that 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 um, shaped those things, um, and they have to do with how that very category of theory emerges in the in, in the first place due to institutional constraints. Question from Charmaine. Um, I'm wondering if you could both speak to the historical intersections of the massive decline of trade union membership between the 19, uh, 70, between 75 to the 80s with, um, in Eddie's research, the rise of revolutionary Marxists of color organization. Uh, organizations and in NICS, um, the explosion of college enrollment as a way to deal with surplus populations and the way in which students deal with surplus life, not by making demands on the university through something like a shop floor or labor struggle, but um, in the demand for women's and black studies departments. In other words, how are you both thinking about shifts and strategies of capital accumulation in the period you study? So I'll definitely take a first stab. Um, thank you for the, uh, I'm, I think I'm gonna be thinking about this question for the rest of the uh, the evening. <laughs> um, one thing I, I, that comes up to me for me is at least from the side of 
what I see in the labor movement in the 1980s with the the league and particularly with their their sort of attention being paid to the auto industry, the the cannery workers industry, and then uh, hotel service and restaurant is that I think um, as far as like cap as far as like strategies um, and and thinking about shifts in capital accumulation, I think. For these activists, at least in the case of the General Motors um, Van Nuys factory strike, um, and then for this Watsonville cannery strike that I use in my labor chapter, um, they're both ultimately stories of victory, but the victory is ultimately in keeping the plants physically in the locations where they are. And, and funny enough, um, Cal State Northridge pops up a little bit um, in these battles in the 1980s because part of what the league saw was um, connecting these various different realms of organizing, right? So trying to speak to students about, you know, well, hey, like your parents are the are the workers at this particular auto factory. Hey, you're from this particular neighborhood in Northridge. Like, you know, do you know what it's gonna cost if this factory leave, gets up and gets up and leave General Motors that is? And, and at this point in the late 80s, like California had it over something like 20 something auto factories. It was a, a hub for, for production, and it makes sense, right, that Marxist, Leninists, and communists are going to the site of heavy production. Um, but in the 80s, and this goes back a little bit to sort of the ideology, the, the the driving ideology of the organization is that they they sort of saw, well, one, the auto industry, we need to keep these well-paying union jobs that Latinos and African Americans are barely breaking into after the passage right of the Civil Rights Act. Um, Nancy McLean's work about the importance of sort of um, the Civil Rights Act to the labor movement is important here. Um, but I think what they what what they saw was, you know, who's organizing these workers, right? Who's organizing the unorganized? Who's organizing the those that are in unions that treated some of these work sites as union dues paying farms? Um, so for these activists, they saw it as sort of and this is why I first thought about them, right, as the front lines of neoliberalism, because they were doing the bare minimum of trying to keep these jobs in their communities. Um, but then the capital accumulation part is the factory in Watsonville leaves down to Guanajuato, Mexico in the mid-90s. The, the, auto, the auto production plant in Southern California in, in Van Nuys remains open for 10 years, and it's sort of seen as this 1980s important labor moment, but then it ultimately leaves up the other side of the border, right, up to, to Canada in the, in the in the 90s. And this is why I think neoliberalism is, a, is an important sort of category, because I do think that the 90s, and this is, I think, what Robin was trying to get me to think about, right, like, it's not just Reagan, like Clinton, the Democratic Party, the 90s, um, I think is sort of where we see that as well. So, um, and then I think the league itself didn't perhaps see the the organizing amongst the hotel and service rec restaurant workers as a sort of shift in the, the service economy writ large. I think a lot of the story I'm telling is that people don't, it's hard to get people's understandings of deindustrialization or these, these broader sort of global phenomena changes where I think that for them, they sort of saw it as like, this is what we need to do on the daily to survive um, in these changes of, of sort of capital restructuring. So I'll say that much from the perspective of, of them. And then I'll, I'll say also uh, Maxine Waters actually tries to pass a bill in the 80s to try to help uh, owner, unorganized workers and then auto workers as well. So there was people that were trying to think about what was going on in the state of California, at least especially from the perspective of, of sort of deindustrialization and then um, I think agriculture a little bit writ large, but yeah. <laughs> I think just, I mean, to to add on the question of different regimes, like shifting regimes of of accumulation. Um, the first thing to just say is, as a basic question of institutional infrastructure, university it has three point five million enrollments um, in nineteen sixty, uh, eight million enrollments nineteen seventy. Uh, a little over, tw I think, 
by 1980. Um, if you just think of the, the, those numbers in terms of population, you have one thing. If you think of them as as people who do work that is ineligible for unionization uh, and ineligible for wages ages, uh, you, you, you have another thing. So I, I think that like there's there are, are ideological explanations that uh, emanate from like the way that universities actually produce some sor sorts of ideologies in which people are in competition with each other, uh, professional ideologies that are anti-solidaristic and anti-unionization. Um, but I think just looking at the basic absorptive function of, of the infrastructure, the the more of people's lives that they spend in in, in a context in which they are literally structurally in, ineligible for uh, unionization actually has cascading effects in on on that landscape um, much more generally. I put that in in kind of context in or in conversation with uh, Ruthie Gilmore's point in Golden Gulag um, in, in the, the chapter about the prison fix, um, where she's just talking about the um, the wide scale destruction of those very jobs that um, modestly educated black and Chicano workers uh, were um, working in and think of the fact that well the the their student their their children <laughs> and ended up go, uh, understanding that those were jobs that they would never be able to have and the ways that they were able to survive if they wanted to have any form of class stability uh, or class mobility uh the only way forward was to go through university into professions that were most likely um going to not have unionized jobs as well so that the, the ideology and articulation of professionalism but also those kind of uh generational this Distinctions that have from um, yeah the, the the destruction of certain kinds of 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 unionized um, middle class work um, simultaneously. Thank you. So, um, I was just checking to see if I was unmuted. Thank you so much for those responses. Um, this was a really excellent conversation. Um, so thank you, Eddie, um, Nick for your presentations and for um, just all of the um, incredible things that you had to share with us tonight. And thank you also, Colleen, um, for your role as a correspondent. Um, we're now at 7 p.m. and it seems like it's time to um, wrap up our event. But again, please do come to our reception that starts at 7.30 um, at Beta Lounge in Berkeley. Um, I'll paste the address um, right now and Alex. Would you like to? I have nothing to add except, um, yeah, thank you so much. It's been been really great. And we hope to see uh, many of you at the next one of these. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to a, a year and hopefully many years of MIR conversations. And thanks to you all for helping us kick it off. Nick and Eddie, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. It was great to hear more about your work, Eddie. Same, Nick. I I was reading some on the train last week and I was like, oh man, like already citing some stuff. <laughs> Bount of information. Bounce of information. Amazing. Yeah, it's a, a, a lot to work through. I like I am so terrified of doing interviews with people as uh, I like I appreciate like work that actually uses that as the basis of stuff. Like there are so many kind of just like um, different spinning considerations. I, I I feel like I never know which questions to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there's, and that was one thing I meant to say is like, I think that there is a lot of folks that are talking about, that wanna talk about the the seventies and eighties and, and that sort of moment. Um, I do think a, a lot of folks are retiring, which is yeah. sort of nice. <laughs> um, but it's it sort of, you know, it, it's intimidating, especially when a lot of these folks are still sort of senior colleagues or senior folk in, that we know. And so how do you navigate, right? Like all the, the different uh, landmines. Yeah.
There was that one last question that didn't get to be asked. Patrick McBurney, I see. Question for Eddie about the secrecy of the league. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That seems related to the question Nick was saying about like interviewing people. It, it seems very delicate. Yeah. Yeah. It's an art. <laughs> It is, and I, I honestly never thought I would speak to a single person. Like all the documents <laughs> I was dealing with, at least at first, were just zero names. And I was like, that's cool, like intellectual history. And then now it's like 30, 40 people like sharing meals with folks. And it's just like, like, okay, this is, they don't teach you this in grad seminar, like how to navigate some of this. No. <laughs> that's amazing though. Awesome. Well, it's 10 p.m. here, so I might, oh, drive, I might drive home. <laughs> <You> crash. <laughs> Everybody have a good night and thank you for the invitation.